we are a brother down today. He has experienced one of, uh, I guess we can tell you since he, he probably tell you at some point during our fitness, uh, I'll give you a briefing on Joe's injury. Um, when he was 17, he had, we were working construction. We had this giant wheelbarrow filled with equipment and he was rolling it up this tiny little two by four, which is common. So you like kind of roll it up, try and get it to where you're working. And the thing started getting squirrely on him. He tried to correct and save the gear from falling off and uh, ended up tearing legs in his back. He had a herniated disc down there. And so that's kind of followed him and been a, you know, burn his saddle for a long time. And uh, recently he re-irritated it. So he's been in bed and we miss him. He wanted to come out today, but uh, from laying in bed, his neck now is all inflamed. So he's been having issues, man. Yikes. Yeah. When did that happen? It happened, it kind of, as he likes to describe it, it happens in a kind of a couple of different things stacked up to get it to where it was really bad. Okay. So he was doing some hack squats probably about a month and a half ago, and we we're doing really high volume. So we're doing like 20 with like three and a half plates on there. And uh, right at the end, a little squirreliness got him. The inflammation went down. He kept working out, having a good time in the gym. And then we tried something new. Because for a while we were doing reverse hyperextensions, which are fun, and we have to do that. Like if you have a lower back injury, it's essential you get blood and you really reinforce that lower lumbar with muscles and get make sure that those muscles are strong and, and get blood into those joints so they'll stay healed. So we were doing some, you know, basically stiff-legged deadlifts, no weight, you know, and uh, that kind of tweaked them out, tweaked me out. The next day, I was, like, trying to tie my shoe. I was like, did you feel a little bit of that? Like, because if you have any any issues with joints or especially nerve issues, you'll feel like that electric charge that kind of hits you. It's almost like somebody just jammed two prongs into your back. And it'll seize you up for a second. It'll be a lot of pain, and it'll go away. And he's like, yeah, I felt the same thing. So then that on top of that, and then he was grabbing something out of the fridge, kind of in a contorted position, digging around the bottom for, like, some zucchinis or something. And... uh he sneezed one of those brutal like convulsive sneezes while he's like you know in a contorted position and that caused traction in the joints so that he had some pretty severe chafing in the nerves which now they're all swollen up so it's bed rest you know in order to keep those joints from moving and chafing that that uh that nerve you you have to keep the joint immobilized completely still so He's been a warrior. He's been kicking butt. Laying in bed ain't easy. Yeah, all that's a rough time. Yeah. I can't stand it. It go, drives you out. Of, he's been reading a lot. He's been yeah. reading a lot of cool books. So he's like getting smarter by the day. You know, I talk to him points of the day and he give me updates on what he's reading and it's all great. Really good stuff. He's reading Ian, Ian McGill Christ's uh, uh, Messenger and the Emissary, which is left, right, brain. It's on Jordan Peterson's syllabus. It's a great book. And then, uh, what did he, you just read Rolo's uh, Religion. So Nice. Keeping busy, but we miss him today. Yeah. So what are we getting into, Mike? What is the topic of the day? We're getting into some training topics uh, in the fitness category. We're going to talk today about uh, failure and reaching failure and some of the different, I think, schools of thought around that, mm-hmm. as well as overtraining. Mm-hmm. Which is we were kind of talking about before. I haven't experienced that problem. You're an alien, I, yeah. Mike. I guess <laughs> maybe I like I read the 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 description of kind of the the symptoms of that, and I really haven't. Which are what? Of, what did you end up reading? Well, some of it's like fatigue based. Um, I can't even remember off the top of my head. Uh, but recovery. Um, like I think your immune system kind of slows down too, mm-hmm. so you're sick more often. Mm-hmm. Um, some kind of those types of things. Am I? You know, what, what do you, would you say? Yeah. Um, you know, those are the textbook, you, your body overtraining is synonymous with your body unable to recover, to yeah. recover. Right. And so a lot of the same symptoms you'd have when you're sick yeah, are going to happen if you're overtraining. And I noticed, I think one, like my buddy and I, I remember back at Fargo, we had trained probably about the same and he was sick all the time. His and recovery I, wasn't as good I, as yours. Well, I, I can tell you the reason it's sleep. Like mm. he would, his sleep schedule is terrible. I still bother him about it. And Poor whereas guy. I always pro, uh, prioritize sleep, and yeah. I think that's just, that's a big aspect of couldn't agree more sol- solving or at least preventing that. Yeah, a lot of the younger guys pay attention to what Mike's saying because you know that whole top G thing, sleep when you're dead. It's like yeah, 
you know, but you're going to die a lot sooner. I was watching on those shorts on YouTube. Um, there's this guy, I guess he was a sleep specialist talking to Joe Rogan and Joe's like, you know, I heard there's some yeah, guys. Yeah, Matthew Walker. Can, yeah, he's like, there's some guys out there who could just sleep six hours a day. <laughs> and he, the guy kind of you know, like calmly goes, well, according to the data and percentages, as we crush them, there's absolutely zero percent of the population that can do that. You need yeah. eight hours, at least eight hours. Yeah, there's like a small, I think I've heard him talk like that they they can take a reduced amount. But when you take people like into a like not having a clock and like the the optimal is around that, I think that eight hour mark. Mm -hmm. And then you got to factor in, okay, that's I think for the average person, if you're training hard, you know, you maybe should get even more. And I know a lot of the professional athletes, like I've read like Roger Federer, the tennis player, uh, like his sleep schedule is like 10 to 12 hours. That's right. Yeah. Jerry uh, Branium, they did some research on the best athletes mostly with like you know some of the more brutal sports we're not talking ping pong here yeah you know, like serious sports um they were very good at resting so he had this funny way of saying it he's like they're very serious in the gym and then they're lazy asses outside of yeah. the gym like they just kind of lay around let their body do their thing and uh, that goes against what a lot of these like top g guys are talking about you know well even just in the business world i think that was one of the things trump like bragged about he sleep four hours a night or something yeah it comes like a bragging right yeah in reality it's like you idiot yeah you could be like doing so you're much gonna better get dementia later on i think they're tying that to sleep and it makes sense yeah there's there's a lot to it and we did have a sleep episode for those interested um we covered some of it we should probably yeah. do another one it's really interesting but in my experience as far and here's the, the interesting part about um overtraining and uh uh failure are they're very, very uh, connected to your inner dialogue, meaning there's no real factual basis that you can sort of lean on to say, am I in failure or am I overtrained? You're going to have to self-examine and and be sensitive to your inner dialogue, what your body is expressing to you in order to really be honest with yourself and say, yeah, I'm overtraining or yes, I've reached failure. And that's why it's a good discussion topic for us today because we're not scientists. We don't, you know, we have experience in this, which hopefully we can have uh, this uh, anecdotal expression of what we're going for so that you guys can examine yourself and say, you know, maybe I have this going on. Maybe. So it's a perfect bro science topic yeah. you know, in many ways. So um, let's start with failure. I guess you could yeah. start in since you felt failure. What's that like for you? Yeah, well, I think to to even go back a step with failure, because um, I know we always talk about like those last four reps are like where you're making your gains. But the, there's kind of like a counter argument to that I've heard too is where I think like George St. Pierre's trainer, I can't remember his name, um, he's been on Rogan, where he takes like a like an 80% to failure hmm. strategy and then they train more often. Hmm. And I think he, he gets more in his mind results out of that and then you have less you know, delayed muscle soreness and, and stuff in that. So that's just probably one. a safer way to do it. Yeah. Too. That's one thing to think about too, with training is like, is fail, like is going to failure necessary for the gains you want? Mm-hmm. And I don't think we have an exact answer on now, that. I've heard some of the people, um, especially depending on what you're looking for. So like, is failure essential for, for keeping a healthy body? No, no. If you're looking for hypertrophy and growth in the muscle, it's absolutely mm-hmm. essential. You need mm-hmm. to push your board, your boundaries, your tr- your uh, your uh, threshold of being able to sustain weight and uh, live in that you know volcanic magma place as long as you can to force the body to to adapt. Yeah. So you're fo- forcing an adaptation process, um, right. and you force that through stress. Stress mm-hmm. is what forces it out. So um, there's a lot of guys out there who are really strong. So I'd like to sort of draw uh, you know a boundary here. The power lifters take, and I've heard this, this is probably one of the more impactful things um, that you can tell a young guy who's starting to train is like, you don't always have to lift heavy to get exactly. to Exactly, and that's right? where I was going to go with that too. Right, you don't have, failure is not directly connected to heavy weights. It's to any kind of weight, right? Mm-hmm. And that's like going, that's my impression of failure too, because if you go heavy, you might get that one rep at failure. If you're in the lightweight range, um, let's say, you know, probably going above 20 reps, then you're more into cardio. Mm -hmm. But uh, in that 10 to 20 rep range of a lighter weight, you can have more reps in that stage of like you're just burning out. Mm -hmm. And I think Mm -hmm. that 
I think that's why when you go to the gym, you're going to see the biggest guys a lot of times lifting the lightest yeah. weights. Very, very And because they're going to sit and burn in that failure stage, mm-hmm. you know, of a 20 pound dumbbell. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think for the new guys at the gym, um, you know, for me starting out, I think you don't even realize kind of what your body's capable of right away. So that's the first part is like you might think, oh, I hit 100 percent and you're like really at 60 percent. Yeah. And uh, a part of that, I think, to to get past that is having a training partner who knows. Hmm. Like yeah. he might know like, OK, I know what you're capable of mm-hmm. um, just because I've just had the experience. And so they'll push you to that next level because I think a lot of people – from my impression of just observing people at the gym, they're walking around it and pushing themselves 60, mm-hmm. 70%. Yeah, which is fine if that's what they want to, yeah. you know, they're not looking for hypertrophy. They're not looking well, most to get people, growth. Well, they probably are. And Some, they just don't yeah. even really know. Like they're not pushing themselves <laughs> yeah. hard enough. And I think those are the people you see that they're, they're there day after day, but you don't really see them Any, gain results. Yeah, because they're not forcing the body to adapt through stress. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that's key. That's key. And then... So, yeah, having that training partner, too, will help you take some of those exercises, you know, let's just say something that needs a spot like bench press. True. A lot of us really don't do much bench press lately, but it allows you to take those extra reps that you would not take because they're dangerous. Yeah, you're confident. And, and all of a sudden uh, you've got insurance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can go those extra reps that um, you wouldn't do or on exercises that you just need a little bit of a help. Like they can help you do a couple extra reps by taking maybe five pounds off just right. through the through that and push you. So I think having that training partner for me um, helped me kind of realize to just where how much further I could go. Yeah, you have somebody who's going to inspire you to push you, you know, and somebody to protect you, you know, so that you can have that insurance when you're doing you know heavy lifts, especially compound lifts. You were talking to me about you know some of those meet Jesus moments at the bottom of like a very heavy squat, Mm -hmm. you know, and your body is in such a stressed state. You don't know if you're going to make it up, you know, you don't. So um, it's very special to be able to, and that's kind of the zone where you begin to meet failure. You know, you begin to be acquainted with it. Um, Going to the gym is all about finding yourself in those stress moments and acknowledging that this is where you're making advances. So how do you know when you've reached failure? Um, I think for most, you're going to, if you're breathing correctly, like here's some of the, the, the newbie problems that I'll see. A guy won't be re- breathing very well. So he'll reach failure uh, early because he's of his, his lack breath. of oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> he's holding his breath the whole time, yep. which is okay because he needs a brace. And usually one of the more advanced things you'll begin to learn is holding a brace and breathing into it so that you can be safe, your spine can be safe when you're doing something, and you can also get into that failure zone. But most of the new guys don't know how to do that, so they just hold their breath, Mm -hmm. you know, and then then all of a sudden they just have no oxygen left. Their muscles got some more in the tank, but they're just going to pass out. So it's like, what are you going to do, man? You're going to put the weights down. Um, So that's one one example of failure where I see them, um, you, you need to start breathing, you need to start feeding your machine as it's putting out effort. So you can really get into that failure. A second thing I've realized about failure is, is it depends on your mental state. I think failure is very, very connected to how mentally prepared you are. You know, if you go into the gym and you have sort of that background fear or resentment for being there for whatever reason, and it's usually there to some degree. I mean, I personally am not always excited to go to the gym. You know, it's a measure of discipline and duty. I get in there. I rediscover myself. And it happens fresh, almost from like ground zero every day. There are those ones sprinkled in where I'm just gung-ho, and usually those are my crappy days. It's hilarious. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's not an emotional thing in the gym, or it shouldn't be. Yeah. You know, when I feel really good, I'm not prepared to suffer. And so I've learned that. But um, when you're prepared for like legs, legs are the biggest uh, muscle group in your body. So they're going to really, when you're reaching failure on legs, there's some gonna, pain. It's some serious pain. I mean, you should be, ideally, if you're reaching failure on legs, you know, passing out, want to sit on the ground, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So you're looking for that. Your legs are giving out on you. They're what hold your body up. So look for that. If you're just feeling a burn and you're like, that's failure, sorry, buddy. You haven't reached failure yet, you know? Um, so failure has to do with the muscle itself just giving out completely. That's why they call it failure. It's no longer able to produce a contraction. Um, you're telling your muscle to do it with all of your might and all of your force and all of your focus and energy, and it's just not doing it. 
happened. So that's where failure is. And is that what what stops that from happening? Is that that is that a lactic acid thing? Yeah, some of that's lactic acid. Um, you're because a lot of times I notice um, from a failure standpoint, it it might actually be the pain that stops me before my muscle giving out. Maybe if that makes sense. Like I probably like, agree. If, like if the pain wasn't there, I feel like I could probably go further. Mm-hmm. So part of that too, I think, is like being able to just grind that out well you know the interesting thing about pain this is kind of a subject that fascinated me about a year ago um the body sends pain signals to the mind all the time saying you know like this is painful and the the mind is what decides whether or not it's like shut like what is the body is a body in a critical situation right now or not right Mm -hmm. um so what you're saying is true because your body gets shit, the pain, should it shut down, it's, it's asking itself this question, you know, like a mother who's pulling the door off of a car to save her kid. Pain's not a factor there, right? Mm-hmm. So she's like 100%, right? right? So really, I think what you're doing is you're encountering pain. This is what becomes uh, sort of your goal in the gym as you encounter failure and become more advanced, is you're encountering pain with a peaceful sort of like you're being patient with it, um, so you, the, your brain doesn't fast track the shut off mode, right? So that you can stay in there as long as you can. That's why breath is important and all that. But I do agree, man. For me, it's the same way, dude. It's like pain. And you know, if it was life or death, maybe there was another three or four yeah. in there, you know? Yeah. I think it depends on the muscle group too. Yeah. Some of those muscle groups, it's like you're getting like a knife stabbed into your arm. Other yeah. ones, it's not as, not as I would say, it's it's not as sharp. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's the next thing I was going to bring up about failure. There are times where your muscles will burn and they're painful. And then there's times where the muscle, I feel like, because there's several things going on. Your muscle's burning glycogen, right? It's burning some of the fuels. There's some aerobic uh, stuff going on there too, especially when you've reached the end of your workout. And then you have these chemicals that your brain kind of pours over the muscle in order to get the proteins to activate. Um, you run out of those chemicals after a while. Like your your muscles may have enough glycogen. They may have enough, you know, of these things, but that's a different kind of failure. There'll be some time since I do full body workouts and I'm doing like chest or back at the end, my muscles aren't necessarily burning. They just give out. They're just completely yeah. done. Like, um, And there's no burning. And it's frustrating sometimes because I'm like, I should be in this zone. And what I've come to realize is it's a lack of those chemicals that are activating the muscle. The muscle itself does have juice in it. It's just from doing legs in the beginning or something like that, that juice is gone. And I, and I wish I could remember the actual chemical names, but it, 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 your brain actually pours it over these receptors and that causes the muscle to contract. Hmm. Yeah. What, uh, for those, I guess we could take this into failure into like DOMS, delayed, uh, what's that stand for? Delayed onset muscle soreness hmm. and how that uh, apply kind of like, because I think some people will go to the gym and they will go home and like, oh, I'm not even sore the next day. I, did I even work out? Yeah. And that's one of the, it's kind of like both the, mis, it's kind of true and a misconception, I think, at the same time. I was thinking about that this morning just because, as you were talking before, with my legs, the soreness mm-hmm. is insane. Right now from my leg day on Monday, I always find like second day after leg day is worse for me. Yeah, but it's particularly totally. bad this time because I didn't train probably for two weeks because I was going, I went skiing and I was kind of training cardio on leg day instead of leading up to it's that. pretty hard on your legs too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but know. it's not like heavy weight It's like stuff. isometric yeah. stuff. And yeah, it's more cardio in the end. Yeah. But so I was thinking about that. I was like, I, um, my experience with the soreness resulting from a hard workout shifts over time as my muscles develop like uh, just Mm -hmm. they become better at recovering they just become better at it if you're doing like sometimes if you bust out a completely new workout you're gonna be like oh that's a new level of soreness yeah but i think i think for like a new person at the gym you probably should expect to be sore you should be next to be completely debilitated and if you're not yeah then i would definitely question did you go hard enough yeah i would if you're like five years into the gym and you do a chest workout and you're not mm-hmm. sore the next day, happens, like that's man. that's more, I would say, reasonable. Yeah, I would you're say like conditioned. that's common for me, bro. The mm-hmm. only le- the only muscle group that I'm able to like get consistent soreness on is my legs. Yeah, same. Yeah, my the rest of my body. And it's frustrating. Like I want to get, like I remember the way it felt to get good bicep, like just ripped and torn. 
I remember that. Mm-hmm. And part of me just yearns for it. It's, it's a good like that, soreness. It's it feels like, good. Yeah, and it's like you did it right, bro. You know, it's like that yeah. affirmation, that pat on the back, like, you know. Well, I think it's, pain, it's also, you know? miscon- like I've seen, you know, like uh, Lane Norton post on that, like the soreness, like don't conflate that with like I got gains. It's hard not to, but you know, yeah, because yeah. your brain, you're like, it yeah. makes you feel like you got it done. What I notice is I'll be weaker the next day. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll be like, yeah, my muscles have been debilitated. I may yeah. not my mus my body's good at exhuming the lactic acid, which is usually why you're sore if you don't have muscle tears and other stuff like that, which can contribute to soreness. And you got to think, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. So like when you think about how much lactic acid is in the muscles of the legs due to the size, it's going to take a longer time for the body to process that and get it out. Whereas the biceps, your body's like, no problem. I got this. It's a little tiny muscle. It's like this big. Right. You know, so I think that might be another. But then you can feel it. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm not strong today. You know, the hypertrophy was was achieved. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely I'll get cramping post workout on my upper body. Gotta drink some potassium. I know, I that's probably the real problem. But soreness, it's not usually a big problem on my upper body. Yeah, cramping sucks. But with sucks. with my legs, it's definitely still in my head. Like if I'm not sore the next day or two, I'm just like, well, I must have did a total half ass job then. <laughs> yeah, you know that. Mm. I wish I could like onset deliberate onset cramping i like the top of like a it would be so cool to be able to do that and just get like the most brutal contraction ever <laughs> you know because that's what you're looking for you mm-hmm. want to have the most brutal contraction possible and a cramp is that and that's what a cramp is you know you just can't control it it's like yeah you know there's been times like and this is the beauty about failures when you've been doing it for a long time you're always going to be challenged it doesn't matter how advanced you are because you're going to have those comfortable you know, periods or seasons in the gym right. where you just feel like a boss, like that weight that was hard for you, you know, and now you're not really encountering failure because your body did adjust, you know? Mm-hmm. And then it's like, you got to go back in brother. You got to go back into that hard spot where you're killing yourself. And if you're not, if your face is not the blood pressure through the roof, you're not in failure. You're worried about the way the guy next to you is looking at you or there's, you know, some people you're, and you're making a funny face. You're not in failure. You're not devoting your attention 100% to killing yourself. So you have to know that that's the key here is single-minded self-destruction yeah. for the muscle. And that's where you're going to find that as you advance, that never goes away. It never goes away. You're going to have to keep doing that. And you're going to get comfortable. And then you're going to be like, wow, this really does suck. I have to go 10 pounds up. And now I'm just feeling that newbie feeling again. And well, that's, that's the progressive overload. Yeah. You keep going. Yeah. And so, I think one good way to get to failure, too, is drop sets. Like no, that's man. that's my kind of my favorite way to do things. Like it's a fine way to especially die. If I, <laughs> especially if I, it's a fine way to die. Because <laughs> if you, uh, like if you do like I'll do like say three sets on chest and then from there I'll end the sets with drop sets on each. Oh one. yeah, and get that's great just, pump on it too. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. I think one of my favorite ways to really reach that failure zone. People think that when your muscles are full of blood, like they're super strong. It's not true. No, <laughs> it's hard to get so, a contraction. Yeah, you know? it's harder. Your like <laughs> yeah. your uh, range of motion is less. Yeah, yeah, you're like fighting against this over swollen I, balloon. Yeah, I feel like it's like that in between like. A mid level pump is like max strength. Yes. Full pump, it's like I can't even move my joints. Exactly. <laughs> That's why you do drop sets at the end, yeah. right? So you can practice muscle contraction. I've been doing something interesting, <clears throat> encountering failure in a different way for biceps. So Joe and I, and Joe, Joe knows, you know, he, because of his injuries, it's amazing. And this is just encouragement to any of you who you know, encounter injuries or have injuries, it teaches you about your body. You know, it's it's a wonderful example of, of how, you know, it's kind of the story of Job. You know, you get wis- wisdom from bad things. But anyway, we're sitting there doing these biceps, you know, and I'm like, we got 20 pounds. Joe's doing 20 pounds. His arms are blowing up. I was like, oh, all right, let me try that. So I started doing them. And um, so I got this idea. I was like, you know, before my arms get pumped to where you, I can't get that peak contraction, I'm going to warm them up for two sets with a light, light weight, high, high volume, because I want to get enough blood in there. But then I'm going to grab the 45s and just annihilate it right when it's like you were saying, in that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Because then I can encounter failure, full contractions, really feel that burn, but I'm not so swollen 
to where I can't get it. Because if you lift super light weights, you do run that risk. Mm -hmm. You'll get super swollen. Your muscles won't be totally fatigued, but it's harder to encounter failure sometimes. You're almost like practicing muscle contractions, not necessarily going into failure. But um, it's something you have to investigate for yourself, and you have to try new things. That's the biggest thing, you know. I mean, if you, if uh, unless you're Ronnie Coleman, who knew how to just send it every <laughs> single time, like dude. wait, baby, yeah, man. Uh, you know, that's my dream some days to just get some. It doesn't have to be quite as dingy as Ronnie Coleman's gym, but you know, he was in there, man. Yeah. You know, think about some of those late and great badasses like Ronnie Coleman and Dorian Yates, those two specifically. Because Dorian Yates had just the hardest spot, dude. He, it's like, you know, that cartoon of like a guy sticking a needle in and the needle just bends. <laughs> you know, like, I yep. could see that actually happening to, to Dorian Yates. And he used to lift in the basement in some place in like the UK. You know, it's just mm-hmm. him and one guy screaming diesel in his face for like two hours. And it's like, all right, you know, yeah. going to a weird place. And that's where it you would get be the nice games. to have like your own gym and some different setup than the public gyms because they're kind of a clown show. Yeah, well, it's there's a lot of distractions, you know, and that's yeah. the problem. You know, you you do have a great variety of equipment though. It's yeah, tough to match. Oh man, you can't do it. You have to spend so much money to get even a quarter of the way there, mm-hmm. or you just get like a cable machine. You don't have those. I mean, machines are great, but okay. So next subject, right? We have. Covered failure to a certain degree. We have, um, um, we got bad, rec- what is it? It's not bad overtraining. Recovery. Overtraining. Thank you. So overtraining. Um, I've experienced this. I've experienced this hard. Um, it's actually the first way. It's the only way I knew. As a matter of fact, <laughs> it's like my, uh, initiation into bodybuilding was complete overtraining. And I'll tell you a short story. So, uh, we were in California and we had, a wonderful house, big house. We had like this giant patio area. So we just started buying equipment off of Craigslist. We had like a nice Smith machine. We had like a, a beautiful bench. We had um, a cable machine um, and a few other things. It was, it was pretty well set up, man. And uh, we were working our butts off every day. You know, we get in there. And uh, we're like, okay, this we've 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 transcended this thing. We need to go get a gym membership. So we started going to the gym, just still doing the same thing about two hours a day, every day, every day, and uh, <laughs> seven days, uh, six days, six days, six days. Sometimes five, <laughs> but yeah, usually that. And then we do like abs on like the seventh day, but it was it was crazy, crazy. And this trainer comes up to us. His name was Chris. And uh, he was a cool dude. He would do, like, weird stuff, like karaoke's and, like, mobility crap. And we were like, that looks weird. Maybe someday I'll get into it. And he's like, guys, I've been watching you, and you guys need to eat. <laughs> you guys and we're need like, to eat. what? He's like, yeah, I guarantee you, you guys aren't eating enough. And so we started eating, and uh, we started seeing some growth. But we actually started feeling better because after we started eating, we actually weren't being overtrained because our body was able to recover. Because yeah. we were in such a depleted deficit the whole time. All we knew was how to kill ourselves. And yeah, that's if you're in a deficit of sleep and eat, oh, man, you're, you're done. going to have a tough time. Yeah, and we were battling things like uh, just chronic fatigue. You know, you'd wake up in the morning, there'd be brain fog, very irritable. We were working more hours in our whole life um, and then trying to work out. We were like 26 to 20, 26 to like 28, 29, 29. And it was brutal, and I don't recommend it to anybody. And I think after, do we have to go hop on that? Yeah, in two minutes. Two minutes, okay. But um, anyway, in order to ask yourself if you're overtrained, I would say, you know the way you feel when you're feeling good. You're not always going to feel good when you're lifting weights because you're going to be in a place of recovery. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're in that place of recovery with the proper tools, like you said, sleep and food, you're going to be okay. Yeah, and protein intake. And protein intake, right. You've got the proper building blocks for what you're tearing down. You'll be okay. But if you don't, you will encounter overtraining very quickly. Yep. Yeah, and like he said, you feel sick. You feel all those same symptoms. you got diarrhea. You can't digest. All those kind of things, man. And there's nothing really wrong with you. No one's sick in the house but you. You know, that's to be overtrained. Um, yeah. So. And I think uh, it's... It's something that can just set you back so far. Mm-hmm. It's like if you just if you get your lifestyle outside the gym in order, 
as far as sleep, eating, even just recovery. You know, I love to go in the sauna, mm. um, you know, stretching on off days and stuff too. Like it'll, it'll just stem that, it'll prevent that from happening mm-hmm. and you can train at, you know, higher volumes. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. So do that stuff first. Yeah. Make sure that's dialed in and then you'll be able to go into failure and yeah. feel like a boss and you can fail as much as you want and feel great. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, till next time.